All right, folks, we're back here on the Marvel Rewatch Review Series with not one but two special guests, of course, the returning of the doc, Chris Mueller. Chris, welcome back, as always. Thank you, thank you. And, of course, we have our very special guest, Nick Torres, who, Nick, you've been supposed to be part of the show uh, quite a few times now, and I'm happy to have you on, finally, to talk Avengers. He's been putting me in the back burner for... Multiple years now. <laughs> I'm finally happy. Finally. I'm finally, I'm, I'm very happy you reached out to me because I feel so bad because we, we've been going back and forth over DMs and text for literally years now. Like, that's not even an exaggeration. It's been at least two years that I've been trying to talk to you about a Marvel movie. And I'm glad it's this one because exactly. Hulk had a very prominent role in the first Avengers film. Yeah, for sure. He definitely does. He definitely does. So we'll see how this goes. Like I've said, I, I can't even say from the get-go that this is going to go for a short period because we got three people on the call here. It's a big movie. It's the first Avengers film. So hopefully from here on out we can have uh, you on, Nick, to hear, to help Chris and I break down You know, this one. We got, what was the next one? Age of Ultron, Infinity War, Endgame, uh, to talk all the Hulk movies. And maybe Ragnarok as well because, again, I know you're a big Hulk fan. I think he was obviously in that oh, movie yeah. as well, you know? Yeah, big time. Big time, big time. So, uh, Avengers, I'll start with you, Chris. You know, we've been breaking down all these movies in Phase 1. We'll, we'll save our Phase 1 thoughts. You actually get, you know, brought up the idea before we got started here of doing a whole separate podcast on Phase 1, you know, on the whole, because that's a whole other entity altogether. So we'll save that for another time. Um, but one of the first questions I always ask you, your anticipation level for Avengers, after seeing Iron Man 1 and 2, Thor, Captain America, and the Hulk, what was your anticipation level like going into that first Avengers film? Oh, man. Like, I, I felt like a kid again, man. I was looking forward to it so much. It, it was it was the culmination of a few years worth of stuff, and it was something that you never expected to see. Mm -hmm. So there was just so much hype going into it. I was so excited. This was one of the few that I think I made an effort to go see on opening night. And I normally don't do that with movies. I normally prefer to watch it in like a slightly less crowded theater so I can actually enjoy what's going on. Mm -hmm. But with that one, I was like, I gotta be there for the first showing. I feel like it was one of those movies. Cause at this point I wasn't super entranced with the MCU until like probably this point. Cause I didn't go see it. I don't know if the weekend it came out or maybe the weekend after, but I heard so many cool things about it. I'm like, wow, this movie sounds absolutely amazing. And then I went to go see it. And again, despite not being the biggest MCU fan, and as we've discussed before, I saw all the other movies in theaters for the most part. And just despite seeing them, I wasn't like I didn't put the pieces together until I saw Avengers. I'm like, holy shit, like it's so cool to see all these characters that you saw all in their separate movies with this massive crossover. And everyone loves a crossover. And of course, the only exception was Edward Norton as the Hulk, who they brought in with uh, Mark Ruffalo in this movie. So kind of transitioning from that, Nick, what was your anticipation level coming into this movie and your thoughts on the recasting of Edward Norton or the Hulk rather as Mark? Ruffalo. Okay. So when I heard that Mark Ruffalo was going to be replacing Edward Norton, I was at first, I was like, Oh, disappointed. Cause I really, really loved incredible Hulk. Sure. Like to me, to me, like that's still my Hulk, mm -hmm. even with the Avengers movies, like that's still my incredible Hulk. Um, with that being said, Mark Ruffalo, he's a fantastic actor. I've always watched his films. I've always enjoyed him and anything that he's been doing. So, you know, I said, okay, let me give it a shot. You know, Marvel has done, you know, spectacular things so far. They know what they're doing. I'm not there. I'm not making decisions. I'm not getting paid millions to, you know, <laughs> yeah. tell everybody, oh, no, we're picking this person. So, uh Watching the trailers, I, I think I must have watched the trailers like a million times, especially the, the clips where the Hulk popped up and any little bit of green that I saw, I was like, oh my God, hold on, let me rewind it really <laughs> quick and see what replay because this is it, you know? Um, but anticipation was really huge. Uh, I remember seeing this movie with my father and my brother in New York and uh, we went to the city and we watched this in an AMC theater and the theater was completely sold out. Wow. And I'm talking every seat was taken and you know, it's one of those movies where you knew it was going to be big because everybody was there, you know? And, and even still to this day, like, well, no longer Marvel movies really aren't that. I don't know if we're going to get that same amount of crowds like we used to mm -hmm. before, but just the energy and the excitement, you can feel it in the room. 
Do you think this was a turning point? Like I said, I didn't really know much about the MCU at all before I saw this movie, but this is really when I started to pay attention a bit more with just the buzz, the sheer buzz that went well beyond just Marvel fan universe type stuff. This is like, it was really just a part of the culture at this point. Do you think this was a turning point for the MCU in terms of, you know, how it drew people beyond Marvel fans in to see the movies? This was the Hershey kiss on the on the cookie. This was the... <laughs> This was the cherry on top. I think this really like put them in the genre by themselves and really changed the opinion of a superhero movie because, you know, superhero flicks were just, oh, these people dressed in suits and they had powers and who cares what the storyline was. This really like put the uh, superhero movies on the map where you can have the emotional and you know, the, the comedy and the drama, and you can have it work well in a comic book movie. Mm -hmm. What about you, Chris? Did you notice anyone that, you know, that you were friends with that wasn't maybe all that high in the whole comic book movie genre before, after seeing Avengers or hearing about it? They're like, they kind of turned a corner with it a little bit? No, I think all the people that I was hanging out with at the time we're already into it because of the early movies, but the Avengers was like probably the thing that made them overall bigger Marvel fans, not just comic book movie fans. Mm -hmm. Cause the Avengers is like, there's just so much going on in there. And as soon as you're done watching it, you almost want to go back and just watch it again right away. So you can look and find the things that you missed. Mm -hmm. Right. And with this movie, do you think it's imperative? I'll start with you, Chris, to go back and watch. I mean, we just watched them all in order, but like, for say for anyone else, they just want to watch Avengers. Is it imperative they go back and watch each individual movie, or do you think it, they do a good job at the very beginning there, which I really liked about it, of introducing each character, kind of like Black Widow and then Hulk, with Black Widow going to find him. Um, you know, then you have everyone else, Iron Man, Captain America. Do you think you need to go back and rewatch every movie, or does the early beginnings kind of give you everything you need to know? I think a casual fan could walk into this not having seen anything else and really enjoy it. I think having seen the other movies just makes the experience a little better. What about you, Nick? I agree. I feel like if you've watched the previous films leading up to Endgame, uh, you're going to build a rapport with these characters and, and an attachment with these characters, you know? Um, for the casual viewer, I I guess you could say they will still enjoy it no matter what because there are a lot of people that went to go see Marvel films and knew nothing about comic books, you know, or really cared about them. Mm -hmm. So I feel like you really don't need to watch the previous ones in order to be, you know, kind of caught up and especially now with social media and stuff, everybody kind of tells you, like, who's who and what's what, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I completely agree with Chris. Yeah, well, just from the very get-go, I feel, even before they get into the each individual introduction of all the superheroes, you see Loki, they establish him as the main bad guy, the main antagonist from the very beginning of the film. Um, I was just, I mean, again, I just watched Thor like a week before this and doing this show, but just for me, it was a little confusing. I mean, they established that Loki was still alive, obviously, at the at the end of uh, Thor during the post credit scene, so you knew he was still out there. But he comes out of the portal from the cube, and I was just a little confused. Maybe that's just the, I don't know, the, the casual fan in me, or like, I don't know, it was just a little a little confusing. Um, Chris, can you do it like a better job of breaking it down, what went down there, and do you think they did a good job of kind of establishing or setting the stage for Loki's entrance there and how he kind of came out of nowhere? I think they glossed over it a little bit, but I also think it was one of those things that if they had gone into too much detail about like how he knew how to use the Tesseract as a transportation device, it would have just bogged us down in a little too much jargon. Mm -hmm. I think once he's... Us, yeah. Right, yeah, and, and we already know he's magic, so just chalk it up to, you know, Loki's magic, he can transport, there you go. <laughs> like, it, you know, it's one of those things where, like... It, Less is more sometimes, and if you just show him transporting in through a portal, you immediately know, like, oh, well, this guy knows what he's doing, he's obviously got some power, he's dangerous. So I think maybe giving it less explanation actually might have intrigued people more, like, whoa, who's this guy and how can he do that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it was cool, too, because we just got done talking about Thor not too long ago. 
and how the dynamic there with the whole Shakespearean type thing with Loki as kind of the overshadowed younger brother and he was the bad guy really as opposed to Lofi or whatever and we talked all about that in our Thor review um, I'll ask you Nick do you think Loki works here as the main antagonist of this movie and also going in do you think when you first heard about Avengers was there someone else you were hoping for in that role instead of Loki um no not necessarily I wasn't really thinking about anybody else uh, because I knew prior to this that Loki is kind of a bigger, you know, enemy, sure. um, in the series of, you know, Avengers or, you know, Fantastic Four, like Loki is somehow always popping up somehow, some way. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't think there was any need for really any explanation. I mean, you know, we really didn't get an explanation about, uh, the Tesseract until, you know, Guardians or something. I think it was Guardians. Yeah, you're right. Finally, yeah. like, explained, like, oh, this is what this one does and this one does. So I feel like, like Chris said, like, if we were to get 30 minutes of, okay, here's how Loki met up with the Jatari people, here's how he's getting his staff, it would have completely, like, pulled away the focus from what the Avengers movie was supposed to be. That was actually another question that I had. So when Thor meets, up, we'll, we'll get into all. I'll be all over the place here, but you just mentioned there by the Chitari, mm-hmm. and uh, you know how he meets up with the Avengers later on. Thor does. He mentions to them about the Chitari thing. How the hell does Thor know anything about that? Because he thought he was dead. So how does he know that Loki has you know Thanos's army? Just because I feel like it was one of those things where like. Thor is from Asgard. He's in the space realm. He fights wars with different planets and different beings. And I feel like he knew already who these people were. Okay. Uh, yeah. Like, you know, us, the human race, you know, nobody knew that Thor was an exi- like a real person. We just thought, oh, you know, mythological gods, you mm-hmm. know? Um, so I feel like it made sense to have Thor know who you know, Thanos was and the Jatari because if they did it, it it would almost make them make Thor look bad. Like, Oh, he's just some guy who goes to other planets to kick people's ass and then just bounces and doesn't really pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I think they did a good job of having him, you know, play a pretty big role here and knowing what Loki was all about. Cause I'm sure, I mean, actually, Coulson knew who Loki was. Everyone, but probably Coulson and Loki, or I'm sorry, Thor didn't know who Loki was. Correct. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, Chris, I got to correct myself from that. When we th- reviewed Thor recently, uh, one of the questions I had for you was whether they brought up the relationship between Thor and Loki again about the whole half brother thing because they made a pretty big deal about it in, in the Thor movie and they never brought it up again, or so I thought. And then rewatching this, they do mention it when Thor first meets yeah. up with Loki. He's like, "Oh, you're my brother." What I forgot what the exact dialogue was. I'm paraphrasing, but he's like, "Half brother." He's like, "Oh, we were both raised by Odin," or whatever. So I'm glad they brought that up here because beyond that, I don't think they bring it up again. Um, so I was I was happy. I, I completely forgot about that. These are kind of like the minor details that you kind of pick up on when you rewatch these movies. Um, but Chris, for you, so when you first see everyone meet up, they introduce everyone at the very beginning. I don't know what what point in the movie they meet up. Probably like a quarter way through. Is it one of those things like, wow, like this is happening. I'm seeing all my favorite like superheroes from all these different movies, except again, like, you know, Nick was saying, it's not Edward Norton. So it's a little different. It's still the Hulk, but Mark Ruffalo kind of meeting up with them is a little, it doesn't mean as much just because we haven't seen him in the MCU before, but everyone else seeing, you know, Steve Rogers with Tony Stark and Black Widow, Natasha. And then you have not Hawkeye because he comes in later on. Um, who else am I missing? Thor. And then you see them all in the same place at the same time. Was that like a cool movie moment for you? Like, uh, like I got a nice pop, like in a wrestling term, uh, in, in the theater when you were watching it. Yeah. But I think the moment that probably popped me a little more than that was a little before you see all of them together. When Thor tries to take Loki from the Quinjet and you get a little fight between cap iron man and Thor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Cause that, that, I was just like, Oh my God, this is amazing. I'm getting <laughs> to see captain America block Thor's hammer with his shield. Like that's nuts. And then iron man comes in and is all quippy and it like, 
Joss Whedon, I think one of the things he knocked out of the park with this movie was how he paced bringing each character into the story. Mm -hmm. And I completely agree. And having those three people all together (laughs) set the tone for like, these are, they're essentially like the, the triumvirate for Marvel that Batman, Superman and Wonder Woman sort of represent for DC. Like Mm -hmm. these are the three main Avengers that we've been following. And these are the three guys that you need to watch. And that scene in the forest with them was, that was the first time I was like, well, this movie is going to be amazing. (laughs) It was probably only fitting that they went back to those three when they were fighting Thanos in Endgame, Right. Oh, of course. I mean, it's those three are the they're they're the pillars of the Avengers that were started. I mean, yeah, Hawkeye, Hulk, Black Widow, they're important as well. But these were the three characters that they chose to make the first three solo movies Mm -hmm. for with Hulk, of course. But um, yeah, so but the scene when you finally see them all together was definitely like a big like whoa moment for that movie, too. So with I gotta mention this too with Thor between it was only a year's difference between when this movie took place and Thor in terms of also when they came out Thor's eyebrows went from being blonde to just his natural <laughs> color uh, was that striking at all to you Nick I'll start with you was that was that like a more normal thing for you I think they made him more normal I agree yeah. uh, instead of giving him you know here's this beautiful man with blonde hair let's bleach his eyebrows and. <laughs> You know, you can see throughout the Thor movies that they've moved away from the whole God being structure because I feel like the Thor movie, the first one was all like, he's a God, Mm -hmm. he's a God. Hey, look, he's a God. And then, you know, come Ragnarok or, you know, later on in the Thor movies, he's kind of becoming more of a normal person and not just, hey, he's a demigod, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, so the eyebrows, I feel like they just kind of realized he looked really weird. He looked like, you know, <laughs> albino yeah. or, you know, <laughs> it just didn't look right. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, it's such a small change, but it's noticeable and it signifies. We, we were talking about that previously with the Thor review a couple of weeks ago, how I think the kind of the further along they go with Thor in this and in. Age of Ultron, his second movie, which we'll get to next, um, and just the future Avengers movies, it kind of feels like with each time we see him, they humanize him more and more. Um, do you kind of get right. that sense as well, Chris, with this film? Yeah, I mean, I don't think this film necessarily humanizes him so much. I think Ragnarok probably did that better than any of the other ones. This one, if anything, sort of made him appear as one of the most powerful people. Sure. That, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, like, this movie, I think, did a good job beginning to show that he had a a humorous side to him. Like, the first Thor movie had some humor based on the fact that he wasn't funny. Mm -hmm. You know, like, he's a very serious guy, and that can be funny. But, like, this movie, he actually has a couple of funny one-liners and quips and him and Iron Man, and they can exchange some stuff, so... I felt like this began the transition of that, that I feel like Ragnarok closed that loop and made him a little more humble and relatable. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, we're still a ways off from that, but I think this, the little minor changes, it's not drastic from the first Thor film to this one, but I think the seeds are definitely planted with that first one into this movie, even though it's not overly noticeable or significant. But you mentioned the one-liners. The one, you mentioned that scene with the forest when they all, all three of them are facing off and, you know, they're, they're squaring off for the first time. The line, I think it was from Iron Man, it must have been, when he called uh, Thor a tourist, I just, that popped me big. I thought that was amazing. Um, that was a funny line. The Galaga thing, I mean, that's an iconic line from this movie when they're in the ship and Tony points at the guy that was playing, uh, playing Galaga. I thought that was great. Um, the we, We've talked about it before, Chris, with the Thor movie, or not Thor, Incredible Hulk. Hulk, where we were talking about how they kind of forgot about a lot of, of Incredible Hulk. They kind of pretend it didn't happen. But with this film, they actually do to a degree. They mentioned the bullet thing, which we talked about in the Hulk review, which I did not even know. That blew my mind when you told me that. And I went back and watched the scene afterward. I was like, holy shit. I did not even know that existed. They bring that up here, which you mentioned before, which was cool. They also have um, Bruce Banner say that he broke Harlem, obviously referencing that first battle from the uh, from the Hulk movie at the end of the movie. Uh, did you kind of like 
like, well, Nick, I'll, I'll start with you because you're a big Hulk fan. Did you kind of like they referenced the original movie despite the fact it's not the same actor playing Hulk? Yeah, of course, because, you know, they made it so, like, they didn't forget about it, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know if you remember when Coulson comes into Tony's uh, building for the first time and he tells him, like, you know, we need you, and he pulls up all of the files of everybody, yep. and you can see the Hulk's, like, file, and you can see the Incredible Hulk uh, scene where he's fighting in the college. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that ties it in, and it's like, hey, like, look, we're not forgetting about this movie yet, yeah, it's a different person, yeah, it's a different style of the Hulk, but we still, we still want to recognize that this is part of the MCU. How were you a fan of how he was portrayed, the Hulk himself, and not necessarily Bruce Banner, how were you a fan of how he was portrayed in the movie compared to the Incredible Hulk four years earlier? Uh, okay, this is, this <laughs> is gonna start I know, I know you did. When we talk about this over DMs, you mentioned this, but that's why I got to get to it. Yeah. So, don't get me wrong. I do like this Bruce Banner a lot. Like, I, I feel like he's more, Mark Ruffalo is more of a Bruce Banner than Edward Norton was. And sure. To me, Edward Norton was, you know, very just basic. He wasn't really, to me, he didn't seem as educated as, you know, Mark Ruffalo really made, mm -hmm. portrayed Bruce Banner. Yep. Um, now, the style of the Hulk, I don't like only because I feel like they made him look like a gorilla too much. Mm -hmm. uh, the way he stood a lot, you know, a lot of his movements was was a gorilla. And I understand, like, yeah, he's he's a beast. Like, yeah, like, you know, he's, he's a monster. But to me, from all the Hulks that I've seen, he's standing up, you know, straight. He's... He's, yeah, he's still a beast. Yeah, he's still angry at the world, but he's not, you know, running around on all fours like, oh, I'm going to charge up my ape to <laughs> attack you, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the only thing that I have about uh, the MCU's Hulk is he's too much like an ape, and they kind of pushed away from that later on in the films, um, but... I feel, to me, I still feel like the Incredible Hulk's uh, design and stature and all that stuff is the Hulk for me. And, you know, seeing him, seeing the Hulk, you know, when Lou Ferrigno played him, like, he wasn't crouching down and hunking around. And I don't know. I don't know if it was because of budget and maybe Josh Whedon didn't stretch the camera out far enough to where they couldn't really stand the Hulk up. So mm -hmm. they had to make him look like that. But. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's one of those things that just bugged the hell out of me. Do you think they improved upon that with the future movies with him? Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, Ragnarok really, like, you know, sealed the deal on that. Um, I'd have to look back on Age of Ultron because I feel like they still kind of made him kind of like a gorilla stature. And then they had him... Uh, uh, if I'm on the review for Age of Ultron, we can talk about the whole Romanoff and <laughs> hey. that relationship and all that crap. Yeah, but yeah. I feel like later on they did definitely make the Incredible Hulk what he is supposed to be. So you might in have, my eyes. No, yeah, I agree. Do you you might have mentioned this, but did you like the CGI better? I know you mentioned the mannerisms and whatnot, but do you think the CGI was better with the Hulk in this movie compared to Incredible oh, yeah. Hulk? Or no? Yeah, hands down because they they really made this Hulk look like Mark Ruffalo. And I, I enjoyed that because, yeah, the Hulk is a different person, um, but you can still see the human side of the Hulk mm -hmm. in, in this design. Um, you can see, like, Mark Ruffalo's eyes come out in certain scenes, you know? You can see the aneurysms and just the facial uh, resemblance to... Mark Ruffalo and Bruce Banner. It's, I feel like that design is a little bit more better than uh, Edward Norton's because they really shied away from the human likeness of Edward Norton's Hulk. Mm -hmm. And you and I, Chris, we discussed during the Hulk review a couple of weeks ago how you know, I, I, I've seen this argument, kind of what you know Nick was bringing up, how I think Edward Norton had a better Hulk to a certain degree, but Mark Ruffalo makes for the better Bruce Banner. Um, did you kind of get that sense as well, or do you disagree and you, you enjoyed how he was portrayed in the movie? 
it's hard to compare the two because you're talking about two different versions of the character essentially and even though they're trying to tell you it's the same one they're also sort of trying to distance the edward norton hulk movie by not even mentioning uh liv tyler not liv tyler yeah liv tyler's character Mm -hmm. and i also feel like it's a mistake not to bring roth back at some point like (laughs) come on just Give me a much better Hulk versus Abomination fight. But anyway, that's <laughs> oh, yeah. that's for, that's for another story. Yeah. But but uh, I liked the way that they did it in this movie because it sort of made the Hulk. They did a good job making him more controllable. Like they implied that Mark Ruffalo had even advanced beyond what Edward Norton could do as far as controlling when he became the Hulk and whatnot. And it seemed like he had a little bit more consciousness because he was actually listening to Cap's instructions and only focusing on the bad guys, mm. But other than when he punches Thor across the room. But, yeah, I, I liked the way they did it in this movie. And, and like you said, with the, with the CGI, making him look like Ruffalo really helped make you feel like, okay, that's the same guy I was mm. just looking at. Yeah. It right. gives you an extra incentive to care about him, I feel, too, you know, right? Sure. Yeah. You mentioned Nick before when it comes to Age of Ultron. I mean, we can always discuss this when we get to that movie. But do you think they planted the seeds here for that Hulk Black Widow relationship when they had when oh, he was, yeah. you know, trying to refrain him from hulking up and whatever? Do you think they planted the seeds for that here? Yeah, especially when in the early beginning of when they're still on the Quinjet, I think it's a Quinjet, that's what it's called. Yep. Yep. Uh, when they're still there and, you know, it's just uh, Bruce and, and Natasha and they're both in the room and she's trying to calm and calm him down. And like, I get that everybody kind of still tries to calm him down, but you can tell like she cared a little bit more than everybody else. You can tell like she didn't really want him to turn into that other person because she knew that he was, a hundred times better, mm-hmm. you know, than, than becoming some crazed beast. So I feel like they showed it a little bit more in Age of Ultron and obviously like in Infinity War, they showed it a little bit more, but I feel like they put a little nugget there to where like, if you're really paying attention to the rela- relationship, you can definitely see like the, uh, the, the forming of a relationship yeah. that, really doesn't ever get shown. Yeah. It doesn't really play out beyond Age of Ultra. I, don't, I mean, we'll, I mean, we'll watch the movies and we'll get to it, but that's never really, I mean, they right. kind of, it's a quick nod in Infinity War, but that's, there's never a real resolution. Again, I know he's, you know, heartbroken in Endgame. I know we're looking far down the rabbit hole here, but yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really yeah. go anywhere, it seems, right? No, no, no definitely yeah. not. It's it kind of just stays in Age of Ultra and they're like, you know, hey, this, we heard all the, fandom getting pissed off that we're forgetting about <laughs> Betty let's uh let, let's not talk about this Natasha relationship that Josh Wheaton created yeah you know they did a little bit in Thor Ragnarok too though with the whole like video of Natasha being what finally oh, brings yeah. him out of the Hulk state that's right I oh yeah I that. forgot yeah yeah when he's in the ship right when he's on the jet yeah mm-hmm. like don't get me wrong it's not an epic love story but <laughs> <laughs> they they definitely like they definitely acknowledged it a little bit without focusing too much on it. Yeah, that was that right. was one of my things coming out of I think either Infinity War or Endgame where like it was such a big part of um Age of Ultron, but it's like yeah, they don't completely forget about it. Like they do it's a good thing they, you know, acknowledge it and they don't you know, whatever, they just don't completely forget about it. But it's not really a major plot point whatsoever. It's not like, okay, we'll use this to get to here down the road. Like, it's not like it was Hulk and... I think that might have been the... I I might be wrong, but I read somewhere at some point that instead of Hawkeye and Black Widow on... Fuck, I don't remember the name of the planet. But that scene in Infinity War where Black Widow dies... Or, I'm sorry, in Endgame. Uh Was that supposed to be Black Widow and Hulk at one point? Or am I the only one who heard that? It's possible. I don't, I, I don't remember hearing that though. Maybe. Maybe I'm just making uh, yeah. shit up. But I don't know. I, for some reason, I thought. You know what though? Like, I'm sure that if that was the plan, somebody mentioned like Hulk would survive the fall because he's the Hulk. So oh, okay. there can't really be a a question of who does the sacrifice, and it makes more sense if Hawkeye and Black Widow both want to do the sacrifice because that's 
that's what a soldier does. It makes sense. Well, right. that's that's kind of on, on that same note. I wanted to get to that as well. They mentioned here with Hawkeye. I mean, we were first introduced to him briefly in Thor. We see him here. He's like a minion for Loki because he's brainwashed, whatever. They mentioned how he was... So I didn't. I completely forgot about this, and maybe I was mishearing it, but they said that he had to go after Black Widow initially on a mission uh, on a mission to kill her, but he didn't. It was like a hospital fire or something like that, and that's how they became close. Um, has that ever really been explained at all, Chris? Or is that like is that something you think they might bring up in Black Widow? Like, is Hawkeye even in that movie? What was up with that line? Well... That's probably more a reference to the comics than anything. Okay. But I, I, I'm curious to know, like, I haven't heard anything about Jeremy Renner being in Black Widow, but it wouldn't shock me if he's in a cameo at least. Mm-hmm. Like for Budapest or something, they got to blow that off. Oh, dude, they, they talked about Budapest since 1955 <laughs> when they started making these damn, you know, like, yeah. I want to know what Budapest was, you know, like. <laughs> I almost think it's funnier if they leave it, though. Like, you think so? they, don't, they don't need to explain everything. You just know that it's like it's some mission that went foobar, and yeah. they constantly yeah. remember it differently. Like, it's funny. Yeah, it is pretty right. funny. Just have it as a running gag. In fact, there's a, a really quick scene at some point in this movie when they're looking at surveillance footage for different Yeah, people. they're showing a battle scene. And you see Hawkeye and Black Widow just, like, firing every mm-hmm. direction they can. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like that was probably Budapest. It had to have been. Yeah, exactly. So that's what I was thinking, too. So I was watching this with my brother, and he brought up, he goes, was that a scene from another movie? Or, like, where is that from? Because, like, you, you said no, earlier. No, that's just it. shot for this movie. It's just supposed to be, like, file footage of their characters. Yeah. It was just weird yeah. because, like, like Nick brought up earlier, like, you see from The Incredible Hulk, and you see all these different, you know, footages from their respective movies. And then there's just, I mean, obviously, no way they included it but it's not from anything they shot it for this movie and i'm thinking okay maybe they'll go back to in black widow because they're so closely linked to each other but it doesn't look like i think if anything i think there was a rumor that that um tony stark might be in the black widow movie for i don't know why you would have him in there over over uh hawkeye but right. it's just it's just bizarre but uh yeah that's that's a big thing in this movie their not relationship or their history and whatnot uh they do tease a lot of tension on the quinjet on on the ship between Iron Man and Captain America. So kind of speaking of teases and whatnot, Nick, do you think that was kind of designed to plant the seeds for the future? You know, they obviously it came from the comics, the Civil War storyline from the movie that would come years later? Yeah, I think if people read the Civil War comic book, then they would automatically pick up on that. But for the regular casual viewer, they'd be like, oh my God, no, why? Why are they fighting? But you know, for someone who read the, the Civil War series, they would be like, oh shit, like, it's going to go down soon in the future. They actually do plan on having that moment. Mm-hmm. And I like I liked that whole back and forth that they had between each other. I, I would thoroughly enjoyed that a lot. I don't know if anybody else did. But oh, yeah, no. Absolutely. I really like how they both, like, went back and forth and... You know, Tony being the person that he is, you know, Steve is like shutting him down with every little comeback, you know. He's like, No, you're not better than anybody else. You're gonna work as a teammate, you know. Mm. And I feel like that really like kind of put Tony in his place, you know. Yeah, definitely. You kinda get those two dynamic clashing for the entire movie and specifically on that scene when they're right. on the ship, which is great. Um I love that scene, and not just them, of everyone arguing, and then you just get this one continuous shot of one person to the next having an issue with the person that was like next to him. I thought that was great because it wasn't like you know going back and forth between everyone. It was just one continuous shot. Um, aesthetically, it just yep. looked awesome. And then you see you know Bruce Banner with the, uh, the the scepter in his hand. I mean, obviously they cut out to that, but I thought that was really well done. That was cool. They bring up the sacrifice play thing. He goes, "You're not the one to make a sacrifice play." I mean, again. You know, Chris, you brought it up before. Obviously, when they go back and, you know, when they make all these future movies, they must have gone back to watch all these prior movies because, sure. you know, not that they base oh, that one, yeah. you know, piece of dialogue, Endgame on that piece of dialogue, but, I mean, it's right there. I mean, obviously, he makes a sacrifice play in this movie, but he's like the whole reason why the world is saved in Endgame as well is Iron Man. Um, but just the little things, not just the big things, but I think the little things in this movie are great too, between how they explain Jane Foster's disappearance from the movie, because you have Pepper Parks, but Natalie Portman is not in the movie. They do explain that she was relocated before they kind of go back to her and 
Thor in the uh, Thor the Dark World movie about a year later. So I was, it was kind of cool they explained that. They mentioned how the Tesseract was used to control threats, which I completely forgot about. And I, I, you got you got you, you got to catch me up to speed here because I saw Captain Marvel a while ago. I don't remember because they have the Tesseract in Captain America. It goes in the water. Shield has it in um, at the end of Captain Marvel. Where was it at the beginning of Captain Marvel? I completely forget. Oh, well they they talk about how uh, what's her face her mentor the Danvers. Oh yeah. The- it like, was, she had it, but yeah. I don't know if they necessarily go into explaining, like, exactly how she found it, because you'd think if she would have found that, she would have found Cap buried in the ice near it. Exactly. <laughs> she, just found, right. she just found the Tesseract, and she saw she saw Steve, and she just left him there. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah, that's, why, that's, that's where Captain Marvel went wrong, because they changed a lot about people's life and, and stories and all that, and that's where they messed up having the Tesseract already, and it's like, hold on, so Captain America wasn't brought out of the ice in 2011 or whatever that scene was. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I can't remember if they said present day or if it was 2011. But Captain Marvel took place in 19, what, 94 or something like that? Yeah, 94, 95, I think, yeah. Yeah, so like, okay, so we're just going to throw out the window that Captain America was taken out in 2000 whatever <laughs> like that's that's where this movie like captain marvel is one of those movies where they should have never made it just to make it you no. know they should have just left it alone yeah yeah i mean that that's that's such a far way away but yeah it's not going a major captain marvel rant it just seemed like it did mess no, yeah, up a lot of <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a never that's a different podcast for a different day maybe we'll get you on on that one as well before we do endgame but, uh, yeah, yeah. it's, it, that just, I mean, I j- literally just saw the movie maybe a year ago. I saw it twice and I just completely forget. Cause I know Fury has it at the end of, I mean, it's the whole, that's what they were fighting over at the end of Captain Marvel. It's like, it just didn't really seem right. necessary. It didn't really seem like that movie, maybe not that it didn't need to be made, but just that they didn't need the Tesseract as such a big part of it. Like just leave it in the ice and just, I don't know. It just seemed really forced. Yeah, come up with a different come up with a different damn reason as to why <laughs> everything is happening in the story. Yeah, oh, exactly. wait, you know what? It just occurred to me. What? They had it after Cap went in the ice when they go back in Endgame. That's what Tony steals. Wait, doesn't, what do you... Wait, what do you mean? Doesn't Tony... Doesn't... Don't they have the Tesseract in Endgame and Tony takes it when he goes back with Cap to, like, 1950 or whatever? Oh, it, yeah, the it's at the S.H.I.E.L.D. Base. base. Yeah, so they like they went and retrieved it right away, basically, didn't they? Did, did they explain in that movie either how it, that that whole thing is so confusing went, to me? But they went back in time to the first Captain America movie when he was uh, just like Captain America. Well, the, when they went back in time, it was supposed to take place after World War Two because Tony Stark's dad looks older, obviously, and then you have yeah. Peggy Carter already in a much higher position. Mm-hmm. So I think that's supposed to take place in like either late forties or early. No, it's supposed to take place the day Tony's born. So in the seventies, right? Which would be or the eighties or something or the sixties maybe. Yeah, I want to say sixties. Oh yeah, because they show hippie Stan Lee driving by in the car. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that was either yeah. late so late sixties we- or early seventies, and they had the Tesseract already. So they probably went and retrieved it right after Cap crashed, and then just left him in the ice to chill. Oh, I guess. you know what? They couldn't find him. That's what it was. They found the Tesseract, but okay. not him. No, but but they found the Tesseract at the, at the same time. I thought who I'd have to go <laughs> back and look at that because yeah, I don't. Me, the Marvel timeline isn't Marvel perfect. Timeline. No. No, yeah, exactly. Definitely not. It, Definitely it, not. It should not require this much thought to figure out where this fucking thing came from. It's just so confusing, yeah. you know? But this is like between yeah. four or five movies. Like, the other stones, like, okay, I know where this one is. That's where it's been. Just leave it there. Like, you don't need to, I don't know, it's just very confusing. But, uh, yeah, that's the Tesseract. Like they, they focus too much on the Tesseract, you know what I mean? They like, do, I yeah. feel like they kind of get lost of, like, 
where the other stones are and they always kind of revert back to like this is the first stone that everybody was introduced to so we're going to keep going back to it because this is the only one that you'll remember yeah exactly. which is hilarious because it wasn't even an infinity stone in the comics the space right, stone and exactly. the tesseract are two totally different things oh did they just exactly. make that up for the movies yeah the tesseract had nothing to do with the infinity stones in the comics it's a whole separate power source thing so it yeah that was something i think that was probably a joss whedon idea so do you yeah. think uh nick mentioned this earlier they don't really introduce the whole concept of, of infinity stones until guardians two years later do you think they retroactively were like okay we're gonna make this an infinity stone and same thing with the scepter it's like all right that that actually had an infinity stone at the entire time do you think that was something they kind of went be- like retcon and just you know fixed or was that always the plan do you think Well, I think as soon as they decided, like, okay, Thanos is going to be the big bad and we're going to do a version of the Infinity Gauntlet story, that they probably at that point were like, okay, well, what do we already have that can be attributed to an Infinity Stone? And then we just have to figure out the rest. So, yeah, I think it was probably a later decision because if you listen to Joss Whedon talk about it, like he tacked Thanos on at the end just because he thought it would look cool. Like he had no plans for that character. Wow. I did not know that. So they weren't like, Oh, an Avengers in seven years, this is what we're going to do with this guy. You know? Wow. That's right. Like when they made the first Avengers, they were still unsure if it was even going to go past that. Wow. Right. That's insane. It, you would never even know that by watching these movies. You would think, all right, yeah, they had everything planned out from 2012 through 2019, but obviously that was not the case. Yeah. Which makes it no, that much more Even impressive. Kevin Feige's like, been very open about the fact that this is, like, they kind of plan things as they go, which is why things have been done in phases. Oh, okay. All right. So they'll plant, like, little Easter eggs that might pay off later or might just remain a fun Easter egg, mm-hmm. you know? Huh, interesting. I never knew that. We'll talk more about the, the phase when we, you know, break down phase one next week. But that is interesting. Yeah. I never knew that. What um, we need to do is talk about how this movie started an even better relationship than Hulk and Black Widow, which is Hulk and Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> of the course. Science, the science bros. <laughs> like, those guys becoming those guys becoming friends like right away was one of my favorite parts of the movies. I was like, of course Stark is going to respect the shit out of another scientist. Right. And then like him trying to poke him with the little yep. thing to make him turn into the Hulk. Yeah. Like, there's just so many funny moments with the two of them. I know. There's just a lot of and great felt, dynamics. Yeah. Yeah. And I felt like pairing those two characters together, one who's so dour and serious all the time. And one who's nothing but lighthearted quips. Like it really, helped make both characters more enjoyable in the movie. Yeah, yeah. No, th- most definitely. I think there's a lot of cool dynamics between a lot of the characters, but specifically that one. Again, it's one of those things where I have to go back and rewatch when I rewatched it recently. It's like, oh man, I completely forgot about that, where he respects him as a scientist, but at the same time he wants to see the Hulk you know, come out of his form, which was cool. <laughs> right. And uh, again, with the little things, I thought they did a great job of when they had Loki in the cage or whatever you want to call it, and he's trying to manipulate Black Widow. It's like one of those bad guy things it's one of those bad guy tropes where it's like oh you know he gets the better of the either the female or just the good guy in general by manipulating them and whatever and then it, it's revealed that she knew what she was doing the entire time and she was just trying to get information out of him it's one of those things right. it's like it's a nice little swerve it's like okay it's not going where i expected it to go or they're not making her seem weak emotionally just because she's the only female right. avenger you know well and the minute she turns around and goes you're a monster it's like oh she's faking like, <laughs> yeah, yeah that is terrible that black widow would do i know right. that was awful Sounded like the line from Shrek where the gingerbread man where the gingerbread man called uh, You're a monster. <laughs> and he spits in his face. That's what it reminded me of. Uh, Nick Coulson has a pretty very big role in this movie. We saw him we saw him in Iron Man One, Two, he's in Thor, uh, not in Captain America, he's not in Hulk, but he is in the other movies. He's in, he's in Thor, I forgot to mention that. I think I mentioned that. Um, but either way, he plays a very big role in this movie, and it's because of his death that they all come together and, and avenge. You know, that's the last word that he was going to say, which I completely forgot about before uh, before he died. Uh, I'll ask you, Nick, yeah. first. Do you think that Nick Coulson, because you know, Chris and I have discussed this before, he dies, but he doesn't actually die because he's brought back on the show uh, on, yeah, Agents of, on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, do you think he needed to die to really set the Avengers on this path to avenge? Do you, because they could have used him in more movies if he was just going to be part of the TV series. 
I feel like they killed them off because they needed some reason for the audience to really get emotionally, uh, I don't know, not attached to the character because once he dies, everybody's like, I remember like hearing in the theater like, oh my God, no, why did he <laughs> die? Um, but I think like, I don't think they really needed to kill him off because they were obviously going to save the day no matter what, you know, like they were going to become a team no matter what. I just feel like they needed that death in order to make it look like, Hey, this is the only rhyme or reason as to why, like they're going to avenge his death. And you know, this is what's going to make them power up as a mm-hmm. team. I don't know. I don't, I don't really think they needed to kill him off because especially if they're going to keep making him freaking pop up <laughs> as clones or whatever the hell it is in an Asian sheet of shield. Um, but I guess it was like a good, like, reason i guess josh mm-hmm. and thought like yeah let's kill him off this is what's going to set the avengers to become a team and this is what's going to make them come together i don't i don't know i it's one of those things where it's like hey, yeah it is what it is no you know? i understand yeah you understand why they did it but at the same time it's like eh, i don't know it's one of those things like one of my biggest issues and not off not to go off on a star wars rant here but with um rise of skywalker when they do all these things like for example they wipe c-3po's memory and then he just gets it back in the end of the movie so it's like how much does that sacrifice really mean and i felt right, like this exactly. might have been one of those moments just because he comes back anyway granted not in the movies Aside from Captain Marvel, but that's a prequel. Um, but he does come back anyway. So, Chris, you and I have discussed this before with Coulson, and he's coming back. You've watched the show. Do you think the fact that he dies here demeans the sacrifice because he's alive anyway? He ends up coming back? Or what were your thoughts on the death of Nick Coulson in this movie? Uh, well, it's Phil Coulson. <laughs> what did I say, Nick Col- Why did I say Nick? I have no idea why I said that. <laughs> Phil. They call him Phil. Um, I don't know why I said that. Yeah, Phil Coulson. My apologies. I felt like the reason that they used his death death was because for one, people had already become attached to that character because he was funny. Mm-hmm. And Clark Gregg is just a likable guy in general. Anything I've ever seen him in, I've liked him even when he's not supposed to be like a likable guy. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if it, I don't think it necessarily demeans his death. Like I, I understand what you're saying about with, with Star Wars, especially like, they did it twice in that freaking movie because and then they did know, it more than think, twice. <laughs> well, you think you think Chewbacca's dead, and then yeah, like he's they not. literally show him alive the next scene. Like they should have <laughs> saved that reveal for late. Whatever. Anyway, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so with Coulson, I feel like they probably at this point already had some idea because the Agents of Shield show wasn't that long after this, so I feel like they already had some plans in place to like we're gonna spin this character off and do something with him. But mm-hmm. I do think his death was effective just because people liked the character. So like you said, when you saw in the theater, Nick, you said he dies and people were like, Oh, why did they have to kill him? Oh, like right. people were sad because he was a member of the team essentially. And right. He was sort of like, other than Samuel Jackson, he was the connective tissue between some of these movies. Absolutely. So to see him go, I I think was a good motivator, especially because they'd already had him establish relationships with Thor cap and iron man. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I just wish that at some point they could have, brought him back in one of the movies in modern day, not just Captain Marvel. So the characters could have found out that he did come back. Yeah, we, we but, discussed that before. Yeah. Do you think they could have done... I mean, if they were to do that, they would have to be like, oh, dude, like, you're alive, as opposed to pretending like we all know that he's still alive, you know? Like, you know how we were mentioning... I remember people saying back when Endgame came out, like, oh, why wasn't he at the scene at, you know, Tony's funeral or whatever? It's like, in the movies, he's dead, and, like, I don't follow the shows. I mean, I know that he's still alive, but a lot of people may not know that he's still alive. They're like, why the hell is this guy here, you know? So, right. you know, do you think they could have done a scene, Chris, where he comes back in a future movie? It's like, oh, holy shit, like, you're alive. Like, I, I don't know. Do you think that would have been too much? I, I wish it would have happened, like, even if it was just in Age of Ultron, because that scene where Fury shows up with the helicarrier and he's like, I 
you know, dusted this off mothballs from some old friends. There's a storyline throughout one of the seasons of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. where Coulson is the one who's secretly getting that her- helicarrier together for him. Oh, wow. For okay. that movie. Hmm. So, so there could have been a quick thing in that, like, at the end, Coulson could have shown up and, like, shaken Fury's hand and everybody could have been surprised he's alive and he could have made some quippy remark and then walked away back to his TV show. But, mm-hmm. you know, I feel like at this point they were probably already viewing the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. as its own separate thing mm-hmm. because the storylines in that show started to drift around season three or four to the point where there's stuff happening in that show that should be affecting the movies and isn't. And it's because they're not in the same universe anymore. Like oh, okay. agents of shield is sort of in its own separate little bubble. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I'm hoping to catch up on the show. Like I've told you before, I want to watch the show and then hopefully we can do a whole separate podcast on that. Um, I know that there's how many seasons did you say there were like five or six or something of that show? Well, I think, I think it's about to, be seven i think this summer will be its final season and that, that should be season seven well okay well, i'm gonna have to spend some quality quarantine time watching the whole show at some point it's on it's what is it on netflix or yeah. is it on disney plus well it's on abc normally and then i think right now the whole series is either on netflix or hulu one of the two okay okay well, we'll get to check it out at some point but uh it's that... not on disney plus even though agent carter is i was gonna say i saw some one of those shows on disney plus they have is it just agent and Car- agent carter but the other shows are just netflix exclusives like the punisher and Mo- those shows yeah those were netflix projects so they'll never leave netflix okay. like stranger things yeah that yeah, makes sense but uh yeah back with colson you know he dies in this movie and just again a lot of the different you know a, a lot of the uh small touches in this movie i think was really what made it as great as it was between you know the blood on the cards when they say <clears throat> or when tony says later on when he's in the scene when he's in you know his uh place with uh fucking loki he goes earth's mightiest uh-huh. heroes obviously a nod to what the avengers were originally known as i thought that was a really you know i mean for those that know what it is anyway it's a nice easter egg right um you know they have that when he tries to manipulate iron man with the scepter but he can't because he doesn't you know he he can't do the whole thing when he puts it to his heart and he can't do that i thought that was a really nice yeah that was funny (laughs) that was funny when the battle of new york happens in the cop scene when he's like oh why should i listen to you and then he destroys all those chitauri or no no it wasn't iron man it was uh it was captain america and he just beats the shit out of the chitauri and then the cop was like oh yeah we need this on this road or whatever you know that was a funny scene there's a lot of again there's a lot of not just funny, but a lot of moments where you don't need to be a comic book fan, I feel, to really enjoy this film, like, you know? Yeah, I feel like, especially with Captain America in that moment with the police officer after you, I feel like that really made that human race realize, like, hey, we've got superheroes here that are going to help us if there's ever a big threat. Mm-hmm. You know, like, it's not just going to be the army, it's not just going to be the police or the fire department. We actually have more help you know and i feel like that scene with the cop like yeah it's funny and it's like oh he he took him serious after that whoop ass but i feel like that really like solidified like hey like he's he's here to help he's not just dressed up in some weird fucking suit you know (laughs) yeah exactly now they really i think that's a big point a big takeaway coming out of this movie specifically with the end when they show all the shots of the news and they're like oh you know Mm -hmm. thank you superheroes and they're also planted the seeds at the same time it kind of feels like for age of ultron and coming out of age of ultron with the sokovia accords when some of the people on the news are like you know they should be held accountable like they destroyed the town or whatever you know um that wasn't an overwhelming amount of people it seemed like there was one or two news clips about that but it seemed like even then it's not like it, it kind of gave me incredible vibes when they were like, you know, not all superheroes are great. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, it's it's a bit more realistic because if we had superheroes in real life, it's not like, oh, they, you know, they just destroyed the fucking town. So it's like they should be held accountable. Right. I wouldn't give a shit about the town. I'd be like, holy fuck, how can I become a superhero? You know? Like, <laughs> yeah, right. if there's some like secret society where I can go get my blood injected and like, you know, like I want to join. Right. You know? <laughs> that that would be my first thought. Exactly. Not not complaining that my my office building just got destroyed downtown but whatever uh, exactly. <laughs> you know <laughs> but um 
uh, with the, I, I got to mention this. This is my favorite part of the whole movie, and I'm sure it is for a lot of other people. Got to get your guys' two cents. Um, without even saying Avengers Assemble, but they have the circle scene where they show the 360 shot of all the Avengers, um, you know, Hawkeye included, just playing the theme. It's just, it's just a great moment. And obviously they kind of do that on steroids in Endgame years later, but it's so cool. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's one of those goosebump moments that you watch again, almost a decade later. And you're like, that's awesome. So Chris, I'll start with you. What were your thoughts on that and how it kind of came together without act with them actually saying Avengers assemble, which they saved for Endgame years later. I mean, that that's the money scene, you know, that's, that's what you stick in the trailer. That's the scene, like you said, you pump the score up real high. And the Avengers score, I feel like in 20 years, people will be talking about that in the same vein as a lot of the other iconic scores from Star Wars and whatnot. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's an incredible composition that perfectly fits that scene. And the one thing, I, the one problem that I've had with that scene since the beginning is like, they're going around in a circle and you see black widow, just like load up a tiny little pistol. (laughs) And it's like, could you make her look any less effective next to these people? Like, (laughs) yeah, give her a rocket launcher or something like, yeah. (laughs) And I get, I get that her ability comes more from her resourcefulness and her physical ability, but I mean, it felt like that was the one thing in the scene where it's like, all right, you just drop the ball a little bit. But yeah. every every other part like, of that scene was perfect. That's almost like Hawkeye. Like, Hawkeye, he's got the bows. Like, all right, dude. But I feel like... Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mentioned that too in Thor, yeah. I feel like they did enough with his trick arrows to at least make right. him, like, kind of cool. Yeah. That nah, makes sense. I don't know. I have I a soft spot for the Archer characters in comic books. Like <laughs> him and Green Arrow, I like both of them. And I think I maybe it might just have to do with the fact that um, I did archery for a few years as a kid. So I always really liked it. And on top of that, it's like, you know, you're basically Batman with a bow and arrow at that point. Like, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so, I feel like with, with Natasha, she didn't really have any kick-ass like, gear up until like the next Avengers movie with her, or it might have been Civil War, with her wrist like glowing up or whatever the hell it was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, she so had I that in this movie. Really, she killed a couple Chitari with those, but they didn't make a big deal out of them. Uh, like, right, they, weren't, exactly. they weren't quite as fancy looking as they were in Ultron. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, it was... It was and yeah. seeing the 360 that, that sorry, no, no, yeah, sorry, go ahead. That's, that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah, scene. yeah. I, I remember being in the theater when that happened, and I remember shedding a tear. I kid you not. Like <laughs> that scene, like, and then everybody cheering and clapping. Like to me, I was like, "Holy shit, this is real!" You know, <laughs> yeah. like this isn't just fake anymore. You know, this isn't like written on a piece of paper and drawn out. Like this is like it's freaking here. You mm. know. Um and then Captain America firing off like all the assignments. It's like, oh man, like this is this is freaking sweet. Mm-hmm. Like and that, again, like to me, like being a kid, like growing up with my dad, like showing me, you know, comics, and my uncle showing me comics, and it's like seeing that really made me feel like anything is possible, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, as with both of you guys being comic book fans, I'll start with you, Nick. Did did you expect in this movie, with it being the first Avengers and maybe even the only Avengers movie up to this point, um, did you expect them, or were you disappointed that they didn't say Avengers Assemble in any point of this movie? Mm, no, because in my head they already said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you, you watch know, that scene, like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, in my head they already said it. Um, Obviously, like, later on in the films, as the, as the films went by, I was like, all right, like, can we say it already? Like, I want that one little, you know, sure. quote just to come out someone's mouth. Um, but for me, it was already said, especially with that 360 scene and that whole New York scene, to me, was like dumb assembling, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, what are your thoughts, Chris? I mean, the Avengers Assemble, I didn't feel like it was well known enough to the general public to be a big deal. Like unless you watch the cartoons or read the comics, a lot of people would just be like, Oh, that's his catchphrase. Cool. Mm -hmm. 
I think teasing it and building it up and giving people years to research yeah. these characters and become more enamored with them for sure definitely made it worth the wait when he finally says it when there's hundreds of people around. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking like at this time, them not knowing that like, oh, we'll have this big blow off film in seven years from now, like without knowing that, I wonder why they didn't put it in, but maybe they were hoping they would do more movies and they could build to it, you know? But uh, yeah, I absolutely yeah. agree. I'm glad they built it up. They even had the ending. It's like that the, the friggin' the cock tease at the end of fucking Age of Ultron where it goes Avengers, oh. and then they don't say it. It's like, dude, come on, right? You know, yeah. And then it that's, just that's like at the end of Spider Man when he pops up and he's like, patience, and it's like, fuck you. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, at homecoming, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. Um, so at the end of the movie, there's just, again, all the little details. I, I forgot to men- mention this earlier, but, uh, you know, you and I, Chris, talked about how Sitwell was in Thor. He makes an appearance in this movie, too. Like, he was on the big yeah. ship before it went down. I'm like, holy shit, I didn't know he was on there. I completely forgot about that. So him, he's a part of, yeah. you know, S.H.I.E.L.D., Hydra, whatever. He's probably thinking, holy shit, this guy Loki's going to kill me. Like, he's still, <laughs> he probably has no idea about that, right? Because his ship's about to go down. I mean, at that point, he's, you know, still an undercover double agent, so he's still doing what he needs to do. But I just like that Sitwell was used so effectively in the movies. Like, I feel like they used him just enough throughout the TV show and the movies. And Mm. if you watch the TV show, you'll see what I'm talking about, where, like, when you find out his character's bad, you go back and you look at every other thing that he's done and you kind of wonder, like, was that done in the interest of Hydra? Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, with this movie, I don't think any of that had been planned yet. So he's just, you know, another low level guy, which they may have originally intended for him to kind of be the new Coulson and then change directions. I don't know. Oh, potentially. Yeah. That'd be interesting to find out. That's a good thought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with this as well, what was the other thing? Oh, so Selvig, he says when they, you know, I, I, I don't know how to say it exactly, but with the Tesseract and they interrupt it and he's like, oh, I kind of knew what I was doing because I built in this to, to destruct it, whatever. So he says he knew what he was doing even though he was under the trance or whatever. But then Hawkeye said earlier, unless I'm mistaken, he goes, oh, I don't remember. Ever. He was like, I think he remembered things, but he obviously had no control. Did you feel that? I'll start with you, Nick. Did you feel that was a cop out? He's like, oh, he knew what he was doing even though like Hawkeye didn't really seem to. Yeah, because I guess it's making him look like the smartest guy okay. in the room. You know what I mean? Okay, like, yeah. I, it could be taken good or bad. You know what I mean? Like, it's making look Hawkeye, making uh, Hawkeye look weak. Like, hey, if somebody comes over and like takes my body over, I won't be able to have any control. Meanwhile, here's a scientist has full control of his whole entire body. You mm-hmm. know, like those are freaking hidden key in a in a in, in a machine like. Hawkeye was just this blind like character. Yeah, just you know? a blind that's soldier. That's why I kind of like. Yeah, that's why I kind of got like upset with Hawkeye because I feel like they really made him look like a wimp in some scenes, and then later on in the films they really made him look like he's badass, you mm-hmm. know. And I feel like that's where they kind of dropped the ball with his character a little bit, mm-hmm. um, because we really didn't see Hawkeye be Hawkeye until the whole him, you know making the arrows on the rooftop in New York, you yep. know? So I feel like that's where, like, they kind of dropped the ball because they could have done a lot more with his character and showing, like, hey, he's not a guy just who can sit on top of a rooftop and be able to see things from afar, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and no, I think... I, I liked Hawkeye in this movie, but a lot of people were just... Sh- not shitting on the guy, but, like, definitely... You know, he was underrated to a certain respect in this movie. He wasn't really given a chance to showcase his full potential and skills until, I would say, Ultron, where he really did a great job of, you know, showing more personality. They showed his family, give you a reason to care about the guy. It's like, okay, now we now he feels like a real Avenger at this point. Uh, what were your thoughts, uh, Chris, on... Uh, what was he talking about? The the Hawkeye thing in the Selvig where he's like, oh, I built it in. Did, did you feel that was a cop-out, or do you kind of agree with Nick where it's like, okay, it's establishing that he's the smartest guy in the room? I mean, I chalked it up to the fact that, for one, he's obviously much more intelligent than Hawkeye, so maybe he controlled a little bit there. But two, he was under the control for much longer than Hawkeye, Mm -hmm. because I think Loki had him under control since 
the end of Thor, right? Like, he'd probably been in his head that whole time. So maybe at that point, like, it had started wearing off a little bit. I don't know. It, it felt like one of those things that maybe is a minor plot hole, but it's not one that's going to ruin the movie. No, yeah, I, I forgot about that as well, where it seems like at the end of Thor, in the post credit scene, he's under Loki's control, and then he's not at the beginning of this movie until he does the scepter thing, so it's like, okay. It's a little confusing. They could have done a better job with that, but like you said, won't ruin the movie. There is one right. line I remembered, or I watched back when I saw the movie, where Loki goes to, I'm sorry, uh, Iron Man, Tony says this to Loki when he's up at the headquarters, he says, there's no version of this where you win. And then when he says that, my first instinct is when you watch Endgame, there actually is a version where it, uh, of this where he wins because he takes the Tesseract. Obviously, he didn't say that with the intention of building to it seven years later, but it's like, it's really cool when you go back and you watch this movie, then you watch Endgame to kind of see the parallels between the two movies, the behind the scenes. You know, it's, it's, it's stuff like that, I think, that really makes this movie as great as it is. Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah. And then, you know, too, also, they mentioned Phase 2 multiple times. It's like, oh, we got to move on to Phase 2 of blah, blah, blah. It's like, obviously, they were talking about, you know, the Phase 1 of the movies being done. They were moving on to Phase 2 of the movies, which was cool. Uh, the whole scene between Hulk and, and Loki was great uh, when he just whips him oh, around yeah. and they revisited that in Ragnarok. That was awesome. Um, the Hulk smash line, did you think that was the perfect way to use that line, Nick, when he goes, Hulk, when he's given off the instructions and he just goes, Hulk, smash. Did you like that? It was cool as hell in the moment, but then looking back at it now, I wish he, Hulk was the one that said it instead. Yeah. In some form of, like, fighting. You know, and that's another thing why I don't like his Hulk too much, because he never really talks. Granted, like, the Incredible Hulk and our uh edward norton's incredible hulk he never really talks mm -hmm. um but i feel like that was a missed opportunity you know and if you watch like i don't know if you want if you look back at fantastic four with jessica alba and chris evans you hear a lot of their their quips their one-liners that you would read in the comics or hear in the cartoons like they really pin the nail in it hard where they really used everybody's lines, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's where I kind of feel like this Avengers movie kind of missed on those opportunities because, you know, you got, yeah, you're catering to the fans, but if you really want to cater to the fans hardcore, you would use those lines. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, no, most definitely. I, I, it was, a, it was a cool moment, but like you said, I think there was just a little bit of a tweaking there that you could have made it, better than it was by having him talk more. And again, they kind of get to that later on. Like he's a full on, yeah. Know, he, the guy could, you know, host his own podcast and Ragnarok. He's talking that much. You know, he, he there's a lot of, yeah, exactly. there's, a lot, there's a lot of chatting there, <laughs> but, um, any, anyway, so the, the, the little moments again, when they have Hulk punch Thor after their little scuffle on the plane was great. Um, later on towards the end, he just, you, you just see the two side by side and then he just punches them and he just, he just falls out of the frame. I thought that was great. Um, the whole thing, the suicide mission was well done, where they kind of plant the seeds for the Avengers being dangerous. Just a, just a great, great ending. And then you get to the post credit scene with Thanos. Me not knowing anything about the MCU until this movie, I'm like, who the hell is that guy? And then like you just go back and you watch it. I mean, as, as someone, again, as a casual fan going into this movie for the first time, I'm like, who the hell is that guy? Then you do your research. It's like, oh my God, this is awesome. For you guys, I'll start with you, Chris. You see Thanos. Did you hear that he would be in the post credit scene? What were your thoughts in that post credit scene with Thanos? I didn't know a ton about Thanos going into this movie. So when I saw that, I immediately you know, looked him up. He, he is not a character that was used too much when I was a kid, if he was even around. I don't know when he was created. Right, me but too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I wasn't very familiar with it. I knew, like, I'd heard the name, but I think somebody I was with had to tell me, like, oh, yeah, that was Thanos at the end. And I knew that he was obsessed with death, like yep. the literal physical embodiment of death. And mm -hmm. I had hoped that would come into the story, but I understand why they kept that out. So that, that was my other question. They said that that was the whole thing. The the other said death, and then he turns around, gives that smile. It's not Josh Brolin, so Thanos looks super weird here. They kind of evolve the Thanos CGI, and they get, I, I don't know who played him here, but it was someone, you know, some 
someone else completely different before they brought in Brolin for Guardians. But the death thing, it seems like when he says it, it's planting the seeds for this whole death storyline. Because that's what I looked up as soon as this movie was over. I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Do you think that was the original plan, or was that just an Easter egg for people that followed him in the comics? Well, I don't think there was a plan, because Joss Whedon was like, I just wanted to throw the weirdest character I could think of at the end of the movie, and they let me use right. Thanos. Mm-hmm. So I think at that point, he th- he wrote that line and like, to challenge the Avengers would be to court death. It's like, oh, well, Thanos loves courting death, so of course he's going to smile. Not using death in the movies was actually probably smart because right now they're focusing mostly on expanding into the cosmic realm, and then Doctor Strange is sort of opening up the world of magic. But yeah. they really haven't done a lot with the religious Marvel stuff, like the ghost rider, Christian God and fury, all that, like that hasn't been touched too much. And that, that might just be a decision that they're making because they don't want to alienate anyone else of any other religious faiths. Mm -hmm. But like now that we know that Marvel is going to do something with Ghost Rider, they'll probably go a little more cosmic with him like they have been in the comics recently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. Hopefully. Yeah, I think it would have been a little weird had they gone that route. I'm not sure a lot of people would have understood it or it would have meant as much as it did like in the comics. Um, so, right. so when you see that scene, you're like, oh, you know, there's the main bad guy for Avengers 2 that comes out soon. I don't even know if they announced it by that point. Probably not. But you see that you're like, oh, okay, we'll see him in the next Captain America movie. Like, as opposed to, you you probably never expected him to be the freaking guy when it comes to the Avengers movies, right? No. Yeah. No. What what about you, Nick? After seeing the team, what were your thoughts? After I saw Thanos pop up, not knowing who Thanos was, and not really knowing anything too much about that storyline... I thought it was the Red Hulk for some ungodly reason. I was like, oh my god, that's the Red Hulk. Um, but then, you know, looking into it, I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Um, the Infinity Gauntlet's comic story came out in 91, so I feel like the only people that really knew about who Thanos was was, you know, the people that read that series, you know? Yeah, right. Um, I don't think anybody really thought it would go that far. I didn't think anybody really, because there's so many damn villains that they could have used, you know? Like, sure. the Avengers fight a, a whole wide array of villains, you know? So for them to just solely focus on Thanos and really making him the the main baddie, like, kudos to them because they probably chose one of the best villains to really break down the Avengers and really make people scared of that character you know most definitely i i love the fact again without them knowing how far this thing would go and how successful it would be it's so cool they had someone looming in the background the entire time like you see that stuff sometimes with shows where they kind of know where they're going it's not always the case with movies you know it's entirely dependent on how they well they do at the box office and stuff like that they don't know they're gonna make another 20 movies at this point they have no idea they could have very well if this was any other like movie universe so to speak they might have introduced Thanos like right before Infinity War and like Black Panther or something. They just wouldn't have meant as much, you know? It's one of those things where you right, go back exactly. and, you, and you appreciate it more. It's like, oh my God, this guy's been around for that long. And, you know, you have the memes where Thanos is sitting on his friggin' throne, uh, throne for like five or six years doing absolutely nothing until like um, not even Age of Ultron. They show him for a quick second there. And then it becomes a question of like, okay, what was he doing this entire time? I mean, obviously he was planning, but it's like, all right, a bad guy comes in, fails, 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 and then he comes in years later. But still, it's this great overarching theme where it's like, you know where the movies are going. Come Age of Ultron, and he's not in there until the final five seconds. It's like, okay, we know where we're going with this. He's got the gauntlet. For anyone who knows anything about Marvel when it comes to the comics, you know exactly where they're going with this, especially after Guardians, like you said, when they introduced the Infinity Stones and whatnot. But as we wrap this thing up, Chris, I'll start with you. Top takeaways from Avengers. Did you love it as much now as you did, you know, seven years ago? Does it stand the test of time? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Avengers was groundbreaking and set the stage for everything we have now. Like, it's it's crazy to think that there was a time before the MCU when 
comic book movies were still fighting to be taken seriously. And uh-huh. now they're almost guaranteed money makers. Mm-hmm. And it's gotten to the point where like an entire industry is almost dependent on these movies now. Like mm-hmm. you don't see movies being made the same way you did 20 years ago. Like 20 years ago, they would throw $50 million at Will Smith to make any old action movie. Now, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now you've got $250, $300 million budgets for these movies that are employing thousands of people. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, without Marvel, we wouldn't be getting all the stuff that DC is doing now with Wonder Woman and Harley Quinn and all these other things. It's, like the the first Avengers movie really did just change the way I think filmmaking is looked at. And that's why all these other studios tried and failed to make connected universes. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Definitely. They tried to follow in their footsteps to a certain degree and it just, it just didn't work. I mean, the mummies universe and stuff like that. Is that dead? Are they still doing that? Do you know anything about that, Chris? That's dead. As far as like, the Tom Cruise, Russell Crowe version of the dark universe. That's yeah. gone. Okay. Um, it's very possible they'll do more with it, but yeah. it, you know, it probably won't be connected to that original movie. The only other one besides DC that seems to be going strong is the King Kong Godzilla monster. Yes. Sort yes. of universe. Oh, yeah. I like, enjoy those movies. And those are pretty good too. Me too. Yeah, they're all right. You know, they're good special effects spectacles, and when yeah. we eventually get King Kong versus Godzilla, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, I was so but bummed. Yeah. I mean, it probably worked out for the better, but the movie was supposed to come out like a month or two ago. It was supposed to come out in March or May or something. I think maybe May, maybe this something month. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, and then it got bumped in November. I mean, obviously at this point, we don't even know if that's possible. They might have bumped it again. I, I don't pay too much attention to the release dates until I hear something on Twitter or whatever. But uh, I was so bummed. I'm like, oh man, I was so looking forward to that because I really like Godzilla too. I liked all three movies. I liked Kong, the first Godzilla, and the latest Godzilla. But I think Godzilla 2 might have yeah. been the best of the bunch. But, um, but how funny is it that that movie was like half Marvel people? <laughs> I know I was going to say. Well, yeah, yeah, literally. Yeah, like you have Nick Kong. Fury, Captain Marvel, Loki... All just chilling in the jungle. Like. And then you can't yeah, go wrong exactly. with John Goodman either. Oh, and John C. Oh, yeah. Riley. John, yeah, John C. Riley yeah, from Guardians. From Guardians. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and for all I know, a couple of those other characters have had minor roles in Marvel movies. I'm it sure seems like have. every <laughs> everybody's appeared in a Marvel movie at this point, practically. <laughs> yeah, just got to get John Goodman in a Marvel movie, and my life is complete. So maybe at some point, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if Marvel buys out. What studio is that? Is that Paramount or Sony or something? For what? For the uh, Godzilla Kong movies. I think oh God. Universal. Yeah, I think you're right. Universal. Maybe they buy out Universal Universal's, too. Universal's not getting bought anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> okay, oh, let's say yeah. if they did, we see these two universes come together and we come to find out those were the Marvel characters the entire time. Talk about the biggest sword <laughs> in cinema history. That would be I would yeah, think it was some time travel that. mission that they were on and <laughs> yeah. for some reason Loki was <laughs> A Vietnam vet. <laughs> hey, I'd pay good money to see that. We have seen weirder things in this uh, MCU universe, so. You know what? I gotta what? say, I feel bad for Tom Hiddleston because it seems like he cannot get a good Anything. role outside of these Marvel and movies. Chris like, Evans. Well, he was in Knives well, Out. He was great in Knives Out. And Snowpiercer. Oh, well, yeah, well. I forgot about it. Oh, yeah, that, that's true. But I feel like those are memorable characters, you know what I mean, that are written really well he did a movie about some little girl or some shit like that and i feel like that was the movie that was after like age of ultron and it was like one of those movies where like you you hoped that all the girls that loved him and as captain america would go watch him in this sappy movie and i feel like the only movies that he's really good at are memorable characters you know what i mean yeah no, that makes sense. Do you know what movie he's talking about, Chris? Because I know we talked all about the Chris Evans movies uh, when we talked about Captain America. Are you talking about where he was a father trying to fight for custody of his kid? Something like that. There was some movie. It was either that or, like, the girl was, like, a student or something. It might have been that he was a father. I think that was it. I'm yeah, gonna I remember. He had a really good relationship with, with the daughter. Yeah, that's what it was. 
I remember what you're life. talking about. I think I think it was called Gifted. Yes, that's what it is. Yeah. And was his was his daughter like super smart or something? Yup, she was a genius. You know, and he didn't know how to react with that because he was like stupid or whatever the hell his little story was. Yeah, yeah. gifted. Yeah, you're right. I'm looking up his filmography right now. <laughs> I'm looking up his filmography, and that there's only like two other movies outside of the uh, Marvel stuff. He was in Gifted. You're right. He was in a movie called Playing It Cool from 2015. I've never heard of that before. Um, okay. Snowpiercer. Well, Snowpiercer. Snowpiercer. Yeah. He was in the Iceman. No idea yeah. what that is. What's your number? No idea what that is. And then everything else is Marvel. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, but what's just... crazy is like if you look back at his filmography, like he's been in so many things that have been adapted so from, from comics and graphic novels. Like we even talked about that. Where yeah. Scott Pilgrim versus in... the World. Yeah, uh, Push. I think Street. Oh, yeah. I think Push. Street Kings might have even been based on a graphic novel. But huh. he was in The Losers. Oh, I think it might have been. I could be wrong. Maybe it's just a regular book or something. But um, he also did like a voice for Casey Jones I'm in that, that animated TMNT, Ninja Turtles yeah. movie. Like he's oh, been in God. so many things that were based on other Fantastic stuff. Four like, too. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. he's kind of the king of like super powered characters right now. <laughs> yeah. That's and him in Knives Out, he's fantastic in Knives Out. I yeah. thought that movie really like set set him yeah. off. Like, I just I just wish he wasn't as buff as he was because like his character <laughs> shouldn't have been muscular. No. Yeah. He should have been some little skinny guy. Right, like if he had just lost like twenty pounds of muscle, which isn't easy to do, to just lose muscle, right. like I yeah. mean, yeah, he could stop working out, but he probably had to keep his physique for something else. But yeah, 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 that was the only thing. It's like, okay, well, that character doesn't look like he'd go to the gym. <laughs> yeah. <But> no, yeah, <laughs> makes sense. That, that now that you say that, now I want to go watch Knives Out again. That was such a great movie. Oh yeah, such. But a I movie. agree yeah. with Chris. Like Tom Hiddleston hasn't been in getting any good like luck with his stuff at all like i think he had like a high rise powers or some show on uh hulu or it might have been amc something like that but that yeah he did have that show on amc it lasted a couple of seasons i watched the first season um Mm -hmm. i'm trying to remember what the name of it was it was good but it wasn't like it was a much more serious thing. It wasn't like action or comedy. He wasn't able to be that quippy guy that people knew right. from the movie. So it was a very different thing, but he's like a theater actor. So that was probably something he was passionate about. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. That's true. Yeah. I forgot what, with, um, with Tom Hiddleston, does it seem like Daniel Radcliffe too from Harry Potter? I have not seen him in anything like memorable since he was in the Harry Potter movies a decade and a half ago. It seems like it's been forever. He's no, been in like yeah. a lot of those teen movies too. It seems like. Yeah, there was one movie that uh, Daniel Radcliffe did. I think it was called Horns or something like that. It's one of those you know indie films where you know nobody was really going to go watch unless they were like super bored. You know what I mean? But, <laughs> yeah. I I ended up watching it at a friend's house and I thought it was fantastic and I thought he did a great job and it was he was like the devil or something like that in the movie and it was freaking awesome but uh yeah a lot of people that play these like huge characters or like you know child actors kind of like fall off the boat like and just go nowhere you know or yeah. the next thing that they're in they're in another huge franchise or you know a, a remake of some sort you know yeah. Yeah, I would definitely. recommend the miracle. Uh, it's a show called Miracle Workers. Mm-hmm. It was on TBS. TBS, and it was, yes, that looks yeah, funny. It was only like six episodes long in the first season. The second season hasn't come out yet, and it's like I have this weird fascination with movies and shows about the afterlife, and yeah. that movie is essentially about like there's workers in heaven like angels but they just have menial jobs like us so daniel radcliffe works in the department of prayers Mm -hmm. and like they just millions of prayers come in every day and he just like the only ones he's really allowed to do are like really tiny things like finding my keys or something like that (laughs) oh gosh 
and this girl gets assigned to work in his department and she wants to do like a big prayer. Steve Buscemi plays God. He's so funny. Amazing. Uh, the, the guy who plays Dopinder in Deadpool is God's like personal yeah. assistant and just <laughs> super frustrated with him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a great show. I would highly recommend that. And the best thing Daniel Radcliffe has done since the Harry Potter I'll stuff. Look it up. It's only six episodes long. Oh, I'm it's, definitely watching it then. Yeah, yeah it's sure. it's. I'm sure you can find it free somewhere. It's it's yeah. really good. Yeah, I'll definitely have to look it up online. That that's my homework before the next time we talk. Before the next time we have one of these uh, discussions. Uh, we could do a whole we could do a whole other podcast. Yeah. Best Daniel Radcliffe performances. It might be pretty short, aside from the Harry Potter stuff, but we could talk about that too. Yeah, but uh, anyway. that and uh, he was in. He did some independent stuff too. Like there was some movie. I think it was him, and he did it for a friend where he didn't actually play like a role. He played a corpse the entire movie. I, yes, oh, I yes, saw that. Swiss Army Knife. Shit yes. Army Man. That's, yeah. That's dude, it. Yeah. I I if heard. I watched it. I haven't seen it, but I heard weird, that that I heard weird. that it was entertaining. Nick, it was yeah. so weird. It's I've really seen parts weird. of it when we were working at the theater. I saw part. I would go in. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wasn't he the wasn't he the bad guy in that Now You See Me Too movie? Was he really? No. Right. Yeah. Was yeah. He, he was yeah, Michael Caine's like illegitimate son. What the hell? Yep. I had no idea. Yeah, he plays random freaking characters, man. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> he made so much money from the Harry Potter stuff. Harry Potter from Harry too. Potter that he's one of those people like as long as he spends his money wisely, he will just take yeah. the roles he wants for the rest of his life because he's right. done the big franchise thing. I doubt he wants to do it again. Again, yeah. Yeah, exactly. He did have that funny cameo in that uh train wreck movie with Amy Schumer where he was the actor in the independent movie she went to go see. I think it was with John Cena's character. <laughs> he was in that movie oh, too. God. I saw that movie. I don't remember that. Either. I don't remember that either. <laughs> yeah, they go to a movie and they're watching a movie called like The Dog Walker. And it's like oh, okay. the super serious, <laughs> stupid black and white movie, and he's like in it for five seconds. Oh, maybe I do some, remember that. Yeah, he has some like really cheesy line or something, and I'm pretty sure if I'm remembering the movie correctly, like John Cena is super into watching the movie, and him <laughs> yeah, he is. Getting, getting annoyed by it. He's just like, shut the fuck up. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> oh man, John Cena's great. Yes, that's all <laughs> our podcast. John Cena. I can't movies. wait to see him in Suicide Squad too. I I really hope that James Gunn uh, pulls a good performance out of him and makes him into a yeah. bigger star. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. That that's you know that I wasn't a big fan of the first one, so I hope that can kind of rejuvenate the whole uh, genre of the Suicide Squad movies. But uh, yeah, maybe we'll do. Maybe we'll have to do one of these for like the uh, the DC movies too. And we could shit on all the bad ones. So uh, we'll have to, dude, you know. let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Time will tell. <laughs> But uh, on that note, this has been amazing, guys. We're closing in on an hour and a half, which at this point, nothing surprises me. I told Chris when we started doing this, like I said earlier, you know, 15, 20 minutes, end up going an hour and a half because, you know, we just have a lot of fun talking about this shit, and it's awesome. Yeah, but it's the Avengers. It's the Avengers, you know? Yeah, exactly. So it's definitely justifiable. Had a great time. Nick, this has been great. Hopefully we can get you on. I would love to have you on for the uh, future Avengers film. So when we get to... What is it? Uh, I keep forgetting. Age of Ultron in a couple of weeks. Age of Ultron. I'll definitely shoot you DM. Hopefully we can get you back on for that one, brother. Yeah, let's do it. I'll shit on Black Panther. That was a horrible film. <laughs> oh, Whenever God. you guys talk about Black Panther. <laughs> All right, fine. We'll get boy. you. We'll get you two cents on that. Maybe we'll bring you on for the other ones you really want to talk about too. Like, uh, like I said, yeah, Ragnarok. dude, literally, whatever. I'm so down for whatever. <laughs> My body is ready. I love it. <laughs> Black Widow, or not Black Widow, Black Panther too. So, uh, definitely had those on the agenda. But I, uh, like I said, this is yeah. many years in the making. So glad we finally got yeah, you on. Exactly. This is awesome. Your freaking Twitter handle has the Hulk in it. So where can people find you on the Twitter machine? Uh, it's, I believe it's Nick underscore the Hulk. 93 <laughs> i love you don't know what it is that's so funny i think i dude literally i think that's <laughs> the same handle for everything including like my playstation account and i i forget everything bro like <laughs> that's yeah i know that's is, your instagram thing so too long. yeah 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 man but yeah they can find me on twitter I, I tweet random shit i don't really do too much like you do <laughs> you do a lot on twitter i but, do hey 
This yeah, is Nick, I Check think I out. just found you. Nick the Hulk 93, no underscore. Yep. No underscore, oh, see? Yeah, see, dude, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have the link in the uh, in the description box down below. But Chris, we always have an awesome time talking about this stuff. Always a great time talking to you. The next episode we're doing on this is Thor, not Thor 3, fucking, what is it? Iron Man 3. Iron Man 3 is the next one. We got Dark World after that. And I think, uh, what was in 2014? Oh, Winter Soldier, which I'm looking forward to, too. So that's, in the, that's yeah. in the weeks to come here on the MC Rewatch Review Series. Chris, people can find you on the Twitter machine at BR underscore doctor, correct? Yep. Awesome, awesome. Well, this has been great, guys. Uh, Nick, we'll talk to you with probably Age of Ultron, if not before then. I have no idea. I, I, I changed the times when I talk. I, I, you know, Chris knows. Every single week when we do this, I'm like, we can do it this time. I know, we'll move it an hour back. I know, move it an hour forward. My schedule's so fucking weird, so I apologize for the constant <laughs> changes, but I'm happy we're able to make this work, though. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Of course. Well, Nick... Chris, this has been awesome. I'll talk to you guys soon. Have an awesome one. I know we're recording this before uh, Memorial Day. This is going up in early June, but uh, enjoy your week, and I'll talk to you guys soon. All right, take it easy, guys. All right, guys, see ya. Have a good one.